Thank you. My name's James Phillips. I'm a music teacher and father from the Watford chapter here in the UK. And I'd like to talk to you about an educational website I'm piecing together for the movement called TZM Education. The purpose of this site is twofold. Firstly, I want to <coughs> present existing studies that validate the educational proposals put forward by the Venus Project. And secondly, is to collaborate with and help movement members to communicate these ideas with young people currently in mainstream education, to help them to start to think differently about, the, about learning and the world in which they live by presenting the educational notions proposed in a resource-based economy. The tenets of a resource-based economy are wide-ranging, of course, but for me they rest on two very firm footings. They are the physical sciences and the humane application of them to the social design holistically. It's clear that a productive and relevant education for all with regards to these areas would be essential for such a society to function properly. Unfortunately, I know from working in schools that we are a long way from a productive and relevant education with regards to our species sustainability on this planet right now. The reason for this is simple. Education reflects culture and culture reflects education. For just a cursory glance at human beings' conduct on this planet would surely seem enough to realise that both education and society as a whole need to undergo a significant change in values if we are to move into any sort of sustainable social structure. So how do education and culture reflect each other exactly? The main incentive system in the world today is money, which basically equals competition for profit. This was of course an excellent idea when we had a true scarcity of much needed resources for our survival. However, this does not need to be the case anymore, as we now have the technology to not only sustainably produce long-lasting goods in a relative abundance for all the Earth's people, but we can do so with little or no physical human labour at all and with a far greater level of efficiency. So, in a new incentive system based on progress rather than profit, the, education, uh, the cultural and educational emphasis would be on finding new and creative solutions via the scientific method to solve problems rather than relying on arbitrary opinions. Therefore, self-development, critical thinking, effective communication, collaboration and a general knowledge of the subjects that have a direct correlation to the integrity of the planet and everyone on it would be the new educational paradigm. Learning would be seen as a fun and lifelong pursuit. Instead of seemingly uh, stopping at a certain age so that you can earn some money to own as much stuff as possible before you die. Punishment and reward is essential for a dysfunctionally rooted society such as ours to work at all and is therefore the current dominant teaching philosophy that is promoted in most schools today. Quite simply, the educational system is a natural byproduct of the society it's in and vice versa. Whilst there may be some positive change in education, it will never be significant enough in a society based explicitly on greed, differential advantage and acquisition at any cost. Punishment is an easy behavioural tactic to attack in terms of its ineffectiveness towards modifying beha uh, aberrant behaviour in the long term. As I'm sure everyone in this room is well aware, people act according to what they pick up from their environment. How many times do we have to hear that the abused become the abusers before we recognize and realize that we have to change the causal mechanisms behind these tendencies. So when a child is punished, the inappropriate behavior is all but forgotten instantly. A chastised child will not be thinking of the errors of their ways, but will instead be thinking about the punishment brought upon them, how much they dislike the parent or teacher that inflicted it, as well as how they will go about not getting caught next time. Children are not born bad, and teaching them right from wrong does not have to come in the form of discipline or bribes. For example, trying to help them to understand how their actions may have hurt another person's feelings is a pretty good starting point in attempting to instill in them a decent set of moral values. Above all, a child needs to feel appreciated for what they do, who they are, and who they want to be. Ultimately, they need to feel loved. Now, the seemingly nice twin to, punish, uh, to punishment in the act of behaviour modification is reward. Whilst this may at first glance seem to be a preferred route to take, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Because whilst prizes and praise may be effective in the short term, they can actually be detrimental to long-term intrinsic creative motivation and will keep needing to be applied in order for the desired behaviour to continue. More on this soon. 
It's first important to point out that the reasoning behind the desire to modify behavior in the first place. Who are you doing it for and why? Because it's one thing to want to stop a child being violent or running across a busy road. And quite another to tell them to stand still and be quiet when in actual fact they don't have to. This is really just an adult enforcing their will upon a child in order to coerce them to act as they do, as well as attempting to impress other adults with how well they have their pet child trained to, according to behave to, uh, to the current social status quo and apparatus. So as mentioned earlier, it's the use of punishment and reward that really keeps our current social model working at all. School is no exception, and in fact, it can't be if the integrity of the system itself is to be maintained. Rewards seem to be the more palatable of the two behavior modification methods currently used in education, so let's take a look at them now in more detail. Extensive research now shows that the use of rewards as an incentive to get a child to learn leads to the students merely meeting the bare minimum of, of what is required of them in order to get the grade or reward on offer. Not only this, but it also has a significant impact to their long-term intrinsic interest in a given task or subject, rather than, them, rather than them feeling enthusiastic, autonomous, and creative in what they're doing. This point's well made in the book Punished by Rewards by psychologist, author, and teacher Alfie Cohn. When we are working for a reward, we do exactly what is necessary to get it and no more. Not only are we less apt to notice peripheral features of the task, but in performing it, we are also less likely to take chances, play with possibilities, or follow hunches that might pay off. Risks are to be avoided whenever possible because the objective is not to engage in an open-ended encounter with ideas. It's simply to get the goody. One example from the numerous studies that point to the detrimental effect the use of rewards has with regard to problem solving and general motivation was done at the University of Rochester. In this experiment, 20 children were taken into a room one by one to play with some puzzles. Half the kids were told they'd be given a $5 reward for each puzzle they tested, and half were not. Once these puzzles were completed, each child was left alone in the room for a few minutes and observed via a hidden camera. Of the 10 children who were paid for completing the puzzles, only one continued to play with them in these remaining few minutes. However, every single one of the 10 who weren't paid, continued to play with them even though they didn't have to. Hopefully this study and many others, much like the uh, work of Daniel Pink, who's well recognized in our, in our movement, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with, with his work, uh, hopefully this and other studies should make this point abundantly clear. Rewards kill long-term intrinsic motivation. Praise can surprisingly be detrimental as well, for it elicits the same action as any other re reward mechanism. This is not to say that making relative or positive, constructive comments about the work in question or general encouragement is not, is not beneficial. But heaping praise on top of what should already be rewarding only detracts from the true sense of achievement an individual actually feels towards the task in question. <laughs> uh, the student then also starts to become dependent on praise from an authoritarian figure in order to feel motivated to apply themselves to future tasks. Indeed, why is praise needed other than to encourage students to complete the tasks we set for them and that we deem worthy of praise? This further cements our position of dominance rather than allowing the child to pursue their genuine areas of interest with our help. So learning is currently the process to get rewards rather than the other way around. And then we wonder why kids are so disillusioned with learning in school. Please understand that a monetary-based society demands a constant influx of wage slaves and that school is designed to be the perfect cookie-cutting plant for just that. In the words of George Carlin, they, the rich elite, don't want a well-educated public capable of critical thinking. They want people just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept increasingly shittier jobs. This is what our system produces. Competitive, manipulative gaming strategies as a mode of survival. Then, in the same breath, we try to teach our kids to be nice and share. 
And we wonder why an ever-increasing amount of them are on or go on to being on antidepressants later on in life. Could it have anything to do with the fact that adults do the exact opposite of what they teach their own kids to do in their own day-to-day -day lives? So when a child, and you might, might have done this, I know I did, and, and that's why I had a very turbulent school career. Um, <laughs> so when a child in school asks the teacher, why do I need to learn this, or how will I need this later on in life? The teacher replies, of course you need it, or because you have to. This masks the fact that the real answer is that in a streamlined job market, you probably won't. However, school is largely a test of your character with regards to completing tasks, whether relevant or not, on time and to the required standard. This means that you will be a good worker in the marketplace, as you will not question the, the merits of the task in hand, and will instead make sure you do what you are told, when you are told to do it, to the best of your ability, even if you hate the task in question. There's another word for that, it's called slavery. I thought they'd abolish that. Remarkably, there are certain rule-free schools actually in existence today. Whilst these would not be the same as in a resource-based economy, they do provide evidence to suggest that a more liberating approach to education can increase the intrinsic desire of the student to learn. Two examples of this to check out would be the democratic school system in the States and the Summerhill School here in the UK. At these schools, teachers and pupils arrive at decisions together and children do not have to go to lessons if they don't want to. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking that these children would not be able to reach a decent academic standard at such schools and would simply muck around all day, but you would be wrong. Because the fact is that the kids at these schools attain the necessary GCSE results even though they don't have to. More importantly, in all the independent reports done on these schools, the kids are found to be absorbed in learning, happier, creative, have a strong moral sense of right and wrong, a good community spirit, a fantastic ability to communicate constructively in general conversation. This shouldn't be a surprise. Kids are born with an inquisitive nature to learn about the world around them. They don't need to be forced. It isn't their fault that the lesson's so drab, uninspiring and utterly boring that they've switched off. Maybe it could be that the child was not given a choice in how they would like to learn the topic in question. Or perhaps it's because the teacher is really thinking of the money he or she will be paid at the end of the month and hitting academic targets rather than making the content of what is actually being taught relevant and interesting. <clears throat> so because of this ill-informed judgment that kids do not want to learn, we've decided to turn to using extrinsic motivators in an attempt to incentivize them, which actually ends up making the problem you're trying to solve even worse. Therefore, I have a collection of activities and presentations at the site that members themselves can take into their local schools to start informing the adults of tomorrow about the ideas behind a resource-based economy, so we can start to help to show them that learning should be cherished and never a chore. Forgive me, but I, I couldn't resist. This personifies the adult world rather well, I feel. <laughs> As this picture points out, adults tend to take a lot longer time to get their head around the concepts we discuss. For the most part, they've been surviving by doing the exact opposite for so long that the thought of questioning their current social status quo and apparatus seems completely asinine to them, regardless of its merits. Kids, on the other hand, have not been fully indoctrinated into this system as yet and are therefore still able to grasp the incredibly simple notions proposed by the Venus Project. This is why those of us that can should start to focus our attentions on informing the youth of our communities of this new direction in fun and engaging ways. The Zeitgeist Movement is an activist educational movement explicitly, so we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the most effective way to get this message across to the world at large? In reality, we live in a monetary-based society, and there's a word for what you have to do when you're trying to get an idea across to people in this culture. It's called marketing. We must start to be strategic and approach those who will understand what we are talking about in the most effective way possible, rather than wasting our time with people who just don't get it.
I'm not knocking any form of communication per se, although I would say even myself that I spend too long on the middle one. <coughs> or suggesting that we shouldn't answer our critics, far from it. I merely want everyone here to question the approach they're using to see if they feel it's getting the message across effectively into the right demographic. The simple fact is that the youth of today are more in tune with the notions of protecting the environment due to climate change and environmental issues now being propagated in the mainstream media and in schools. In my experience, they're ready to hear what we are saying with a far more open mind than the older generations are. Also, on a more pragmatic note, they'll be around for a lot longer to be able to push for this direction than any adult will be. That may seem harsh and cold, but it's true. We all have old schools, for example. Why not give them a call to see if you can do a presentation there? In the UK, we have the perfect opportunity to do this with what's called citizenship lessons or general studies. I'd never done a presentation of this kind before, but I'm a big believer in jumping in the deep end and learning to swim. So, I ended up talking to a captive audience of 180 kids, uh, uh, kids and teachers at a secondary school I teach at about the Zeitgeist Movement and the Venus Project. And, and here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that if even 200,000 members of the Zeitgeist Movement did this and went to just one school and talked to 180 kids as I did, then we could potentially reach approximately 36 million young adults about to enter this system. If we are an activist educational movement, then activities like this are imperative. We must make sure we are walking the walk and not just talking the talk, myself included. That is why I've been into several schools to do everything from playing collaborative games with seven-year-olds to giving full presentations on the Venus Project to 17-year-olds. One example I'd like to share with you is a game I played for the five to 10 age range where you take three hoops and put them in a row at equal distances of a few meters apart. In the middle hoop, you have an uneven number of bean bags and at the other hoops, you have an even number of kids per side. The rules are that you have to get as many bean bags in your team's hoop as possible, and you're only allowed to carry one bag at a time. Other than that, try not to kill each other, but anything goes. I'm sure you can imagine the chaos that ensued. Before long, there were bean bags up jumpers, throwing the bags from the middle hoop to their own and all sorts. Occasionally, I'd stop the game and count up the bean bags, and, the, and the then the team with the more bean bags, you know, as they were cheering their supposed victory, I would remind the opposite team that the game was not over and the chaos would start all over again. After a while of this, I stopped the game and asked them how long this could go on for, to which, of course, they replied, forever. <laughs> I then asked what the solution was, and one child got it. Anybody got any ideas? Sorry? Joint teams. Yeah, you're going in the right direction. Hey. <laughs> got it. Put all the hoops together and put the bean bags in the middle. The only way to win was to share, and the seed has been planted, so to speak. I think this game personifies our current social paradigm rather eloquently myself. We could stop the game anytime we like. So ideas like this. Thank you. As Bill Hicks said, it's just a choice, people, between fear and love. Right, it's an ideas like this that came from members' contributions. I now need a team of people to help me correlate all the necessary studies for the site and to contribute any ideas that you consider useful with regards to helping to get this message across to the younger generations. The project is still in the developmental stages, so please do let me know if you want to be involved and can help me by emailing the website uh, at uh, www.tzmeducation.org. Obviously, don't email the website. Go to the contact section. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah. The... The children of today deserve a better tomorrow than the one currently on offer. The time to start making that tomorrow a reality is today. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Yeah. A magnificent Jim Phillips. <laughs>